Hi, my name is Mike Kelly. I'm the head of the Archives and Special Collections at Amherst College, and I want to tell you just a little bit about the history of the Native American Literature Collection that is here in the Archives and Special Collections in Frost Library. The story begins in 2012 when Amherst College hired two new Native Studies faculty, Professor Lisa Brooks and Professor Kiara Vigil. Both of them came to introduce themselves down here in the archives as soon as they got to campus and asked what sort of materials we had that could support teaching and research in Native Studies. Unfortunately, the answer was very little. Um, typical of most colonial institutions of Amherst size and age, we did not have a very strong holdings in Native authored material, although we did have some conventional high spots like a set of Curtis's American Indian and McKinney and Hall's uh, Portrait Gallery. But in terms of books authored by Native people, we had very, very little. Um, fortunately, at almost exactly the same time, uh, through an amazing coincidence, a local bookseller named Ken Lopez mailed out this pamphlet. Uh, Ken Lopez has long been a specialist in Native American literature. Uh, he's been a bookseller for many decades. And he was offering for sale the private library compiled by Pablo Eisenberg. So this is not entirely unusual for a rare bookseller to put together a special pamphlet or brochure to sell a very large collection. One of the important details of the sale of the Eisenberg collection is that Mr. Eisenberg did not want to split it up. And so he had accumulated close to 1,500 books authored by native writers, and he wanted to sell it as a single piece. And that was a great example of us knowing that we had very little in this field and seizing the opportunity. So, so in the acquisition of a single collection compiled by a single individual, um, and thanks to the generous support of Young Hee Kim Wade, class of 1982, we were able to correct a serious gap in our holdings in one fell swoop. And so in 2013, I believe it was August 2013, the Pablo Eisenberg Native American Literature Collection was delivered to Amherst College. And I want to show just a few of the more rare and scarce items that we have, uh, but I also want to take this opportunity to go into the stacks. The archives is usually a closed stacks library, but I do want to show how these books are stored and give you a sense of the scale of the collection that we're talking about. When Amherst acquired the Eisenberg collection, this was the oldest item that came with it. This is a sermon preached at the execution of Moses Paul, an Indian, authored by Samson Occam. Occam is a Mohegan, uh, Christian Mohegan preacher, author, community leader, organizer, amazing individual. And as someone with a very deep background in rare books, but almost no background in Native Studies at the time, what struck me about this particular item is the micro-narrative on the title page. And so it's a sermon preached at the execution of Moses Paul, and that execution took place on uh, September 2nd, 1772. And as a bibliographer, I was immediately struck by the fact that the date on the title page is 1772, and it's also the fourth edition. And so what this tells us from a book historical point of view, is that this sermon was so in demand that it had to be reprinted four times in the year 1772. If we add to that the knowledge that the execution that this sermon was preached at only happened in September of that year, that's an even more remarkable event. And one of the things that I've been very pleased with this collection is that we started with this fourth edition of Samson Occam, but and the point I want to emphasize the most is we continue to add and we continue to grow this collection. This was a wonderful gift that came to us from an Amherst College alum named uh, Peter Webb. And this is another edition of Samson Occam's sermon. And so again, you see it's a sermon preached at the execution of Moses Paul. And this one is printed in New London. This is actually the second edition. Uh, the first edition was printed in New Haven, Connecticut, where the execution took place. But what we love about this item in particular, which is sort of really exemplary of the kind of collection that we're trying to build here, is that it's not simply having another edition of Occam's Sermon, but this copy has been bound. That someone took the time 
to make a wrapper for their copy of Occam's Sermon. And we were able to determine from the newspaper that this newspaper is from 1781. And so someone almost a decade after the sermon had been published decided they needed to wrap it in something to protect it. And so this is the, a good example of how we look at the entire object, that this collection is not simply about preserving a text, it's about preserving these objects, these carriers of knowledge, these bearers of information. And so in addition to these two editions of Occam's Sermon from the 18th century, um, we also have more. And so from the one closest to me here is the 1788 London edition of Occam's Sermon. Next to it is a Springfield edition of Occam's Sermon that we believe was printed in 1805 uh, by Henry Brewer. Interesting coincidence, Henry Brewer of Springfield also printed the first American edition of the Quran. So immediately, something very interesting might be happening in Springfield in 1805 that's worthy of further study. And then this third uh, one shown here is a Welsh translation of Samson Occam's Sermon. Um, this one was printed in 1827. We know there was an earlier edition of Occam's Sermon published in Welsh in 1789. And only by gathering these and bringing them together are we able to start seeing patterns, but also able to start asking questions. What is going on in Wales in 1827 that they would want to reprint a sermon by a Native American who had died almost 40 years before? So part of our goal here is simply accumulating material that we aim to acquire any book authored by a Native American person, uh, largely sticking with North America as far as the Arctic Circle down to the current border with Mexico. We do have some material from Hawaii uh, and we have some material from Alaska and the Arctic Circle. Largely uh, Canadian and US authors are represented in this collection and I'll talk more about that as we get downstairs. Other items that keep coming up, we, when we began this project, when we began this collection, we really did not know how much material there was. We didn't know if 1,500 books was most of the Native American literature that was out there, or if we were at the very tip of the iceberg. And it's items like this that make me think we will never know just how much is out there, because this is a pamphlet published by a guy named George Spywood, um, and this was simply him writing his autobiography to try and raise some money to save his house, which is what it says right there on the title. This book is got up as an object of charity, the author having met with several losses by bad notes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and in here he talks about, uh, you know, my father belonged to the Pumim tribe, my mother belonged to the Mashpee tribe. And so this is an example of you know, he's not Samson Occam. George Spywood is someone who is largely unknown, and yet because we have this book, someone can come in and do the work and can revive and tell us something about this individual who may otherwise have been lost to time. I'm here in the stacks down on sea level in Frost Library, a place that patrons are not generally allowed to go or close stacks collection for the security of the materials and to make sure things are here and preserved long term. Um, but a glimpse at any one of these shelves shows the range of materials that we have been collecting here at Amherst. So for instance, uh, we have a copy of Queen of the Woods by Simon Polkagan. This is an 1899 novel uh, by um, Polkagan. Uh, we have multiple copies of it, including a later reprint. Um, so this was a facsimile reprint from the 1960s, it looks like. And what we want to do by collecting multiple copies and multiple editions is show how books are presented and then represented over time. And so another example of that would be um, something like John Joseph Matthews. Here's a first edition of The Osage by Matthews, which comes out in 1961. And then right next to it on the shelf is a recent reprint from University of Oklahoma Press. And so one of our goals is for people to be able to search our catalog and see, has anyone done a new edition of this particular book or that particular book? We're a long way from that goal. That's an aspirational goal. But that's our aim, is to be the place that, oh, if someone publishes a new edition, 
of Matthews or of any other native writer, that we would get it in the new edition, we would have it in the first edition, and really be a comprehensive collection. That is really the goal of what we're doing here. Um, many of the books on these shelves are not particularly old. Many of them are not particularly rare. Uh, but we do have some very exciting items because we're collecting so widely. Um, this is a the one and only instance in our collection of a birch bark and porcupine quill work binding. This is a book by A.J. Blackbird. Um, it is a history of the Ottawa and Chippewa that was published in 1887. This copy is one of two that the author's sister bound specially uh, in birch bark and quilt work. And there's actually a lovely article by a scholar named Dan Raddus that talks about this specific copy of this book. One of the unintended consequences of shelving the books in the Native American Literature Collection just in the Library of Congress call number system, integrating them with all of our other holdings, has been the way that it highlights some of the inequities built into uh, the Library of Congress call number system. And so, for instance, we have an anthology of, uh, you know, called Writing the Circle, Native Women of Western Canada, so clearly an anthology of indigenous writing uh, in Canada, First Nations in Canada. This is classified in the PR 9199 range, um, and that is where all First Nations writers in Canada end up. This is a subsection within the PR classification is generally for English literature. So this is the shelf opposite me. This is where Charles Dickens and Sir Walter Scott are. And although, you know, I don't think that the people designing the Library of Congress call number system had the erasure of indigenous identity in mind, but the creation of this subclass. So here is E. Pauline Johnson. She's a Mohawk writer who happened to be from the northern side of the St. Lawrence River. Um, and so she is classified as a Canadian author and her books end up in the same spot as all other First Nations writers in Canada, PR 9199, and then a subclass, um, effectively erasing her indigenous identity and classifying her instead as a writer in English outside of Great Britain. And so these are subtle things. These are not the worst things but this is the structure that libraries are dealing with and the structure that we attempt to push back on somewhat in our library cataloging. Now I'm going to take you to another section of the call number range where we'll find another Mohawk writer who has been erased in a different way. Here in the PS section of the call number range uh, we find American literature. So PR is British literature, PS is for American literature, and unlike the uh, PR classification, which uh, replicates the reservation approach to indigenous people, we're going to put them all in one class over here, separate from the rest of Canadian writers. This is their special place. We put them all back together there. The uh, PS section of the call number classification is more about... Um, termination of indigenous identity. So here's another Mohawk writer. This is poems by Maurice Kenny, um, writing about uh, Molly Brandt, um, a Mohawk writer writing about a great Mohawk leader. Maurice Kenny is from upstate New York. He was from Watertown, New York. He was born on the United States side of the U.S.-Canada border. And so his books are classified as PS 3561. The way the PSs work is that it's simply chronological alphabetical that the description of the class is for individual authors. And what a great statement of American individualism than, you know, to take people out of their context and say, this is simply Maurice Kenny. He is a writer in America. He is an American writer. Again, his Mohawk identity has been erased. What we have tried to do in our collection, in our cataloging, is insert those uh, subject headings, non-standard subject headings, non-standard identifiers that would tag Maurice Kenny is a Mohawk writer. E. Pauline Johnson is a Mohawk writer. So in our catalog, at least, you can search for Mohawk writers and you will find both. There is simply no other cataloging system that will allow you to do that. Those are non-standard notes that we add to undo the separation that happens through Library of Congress cataloging. 
Um, and you can also see on these shelves, you know, there's a real mix that here's Stephen Graham Jones, here's Maurice Kenny, um, and then just in with standard fiction, uh, Dennis Johnson, for instance, A.M. Holmes, um, that the PS call number classification has a flattening effect on people's identities. Um, and yet, it's fun to browse our stacks and see where we find someone like Susan Powers, right next to Richard Powers. Um, or here's, you know, Toni Morrison, Bradford Morrow, and then here we go with Lewis Owens. Um, so the effect of the Library of Congress classification system is to replicate the structures of the federal government. Let's not forget that LC is the Library of Congress, that this is a federal system by which native people's books are classified. Um, and just because we're right near it, this is one of my favorites in the collection. Um, as I've said, not every book in the collection is especially rare or especially valuable, but it really tells us something if we see the way that Martin Cruz Smith, who wrote this science fiction novel about um, the Indians won, uh, pretty clear message there, um, and how it's packaged before he wrote the best-selling novel Gorky Park and after he wrote the best-selling novel Gorky Park. And in our catalog record for Gorky Park, uh, Martin Cruz Smith's indigenous identity is restored through the addition of those subject headings. We're now in the oversized section of the ELC call number classification. And this is another example of the unintended consequences and juxtapositions that happen when you shelve and integrate a collection according to LC call numbers. So this is a volume of Indian treaties printed by Benjamin Franklin. And this is a book that comes out in 1938 and is a celebration of the wonderful greatness of Benjamin Franklin, the hero of American printing, the American Revolution, and so on. Um, Professor Lisa Brooks teaches Indian treaties as literature. This is an important document. So this is one that the college might have collected to celebrate Benjamin Franklin and the greatness of American printing and colonial history that is now very useful for our faculty who are diving into indigenous studies in new ways. Um, and right next to it on the shelf is an example of one of the ways that we've been building the collection. So this is Shadows of Sherman Institute, a photographic history of the Indian school at Magnolia Avenue. This is classed in the E97, oversized, it's kind of big. But this is also a book that we purchased directly from the people who published it at the Tribal, the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums conference um, in, I think, 2018. And so what we have been doing to build the collection and to build relationships is going to conferences and wherever possible, buying books directly from communities, buying books directly from people who are producing them and want to share this knowledge with the world. And so right next to Benjamin Franklin is now a volume produced by native people in California um, talking about their own history. And so we can trace, you know, and here you don't get much further from Benjamin Franklin than um, Russell Means. And so this is an example of an artist book. This is a collaboration between Russell Means and a uh, book artist named Peter Bogardus uh, called The Great Mystery. Um, and in between, we have a wide range of, you know, paperback books, preserving traditional native arts. Um, we have a very wide selection of, you know, popular works, scholarly works. Uh, we include children's books. We include books of photography. Um, the range of genres is as wide as the range of books that have been written by Native folks. In spite of the limitations of the Library of Congress call number system, we have actively been acquiring material since the arrival of the collection in 2013. By the summer of 2014, all of the items in that original purchase were added to the Five College Library catalog and available for use in the Archives and Special Collections Reading Room and Frost Library. 
The first exhibition of the collection ran from February through July of 2014, and we regularly display selections from the collection in our exhibition spaces. Our acquisitions range from rare early works to newly printed fiction and poetry to zines and other more ephemeral forms of publication, such as posters and even stickers. The collection now stands at just over 3,000 books, more than double the size of the original acquisition from Pablo Eisenberg, with no end in sight. Thanks to the efforts of people like Lee Francis, founder of Red Planet Books, and many, many other people working across Indian country, it is easier than ever to add indigenous-created materials to our holdings, and we hope that other institutions will follow this lead. We continue to explore ways to better represent these materials, and to that end have received a Mellon Foundation grant to support further work on community consultation and ways that we can better embed indigenous knowledge into our library systems.